Okay, so welcome everyone to this webinar of European Society of Surgical Oncology. Uh, tonight, the topic will be the second victim, acceptance of being a human. We have prepared for you a wonderful speakers. And uh, the first of them is uh, Professor Pompilio Piso. He is the president of the German Society of General and Visceral Surgery. And he's also a board member uh, of the European Society of Surgical Oncology. He is chairman of the Department of General and Visceral Surgery of the University Hospital in Regensburg, Germany, and chairman of the Visceral Oncology Center in the same institution. He will speak about the second victim phenomenon, the real size of the problem. Next, we will have Dr. Margarita Tarain. Uh, she is clinical psychologist. She is head of the Psycho Oncology Unit in Atipa Dem Tokuda and City Clinic Hospital in Sofia, Bulgaria. She has many years of experience in training and working with medical professionals in the area of breaking bad news and discussing prognosis, building effective doctor patient relationships, and medical ethics. She introduces for the first time in Bulgaria the establishment of a unit and algorithm for action in cases of second victim. She will speak about being a human when considered God, the load of professional ideal, the load of professional ideal. After that, we have Dr. Maximilian Babuken. He is a surgical intern in University Hospital in Regensburg. And he already have an experience in organizing workshops in the same topics in Hamburg. He will give us some um, ideas for mechanisms to overcome distress and programs for support. We have finally our discutant uh, this, uh, this evening. This is, uh, she's a lawyer, Kalina Mikhailova. She practiced in the field of corporative, commercial, medical law and healthcare. She's legally consulting international and national clients. She's a member of a specialized healthcare teams who are looking for effective legislation, leg legislative changes in healthcare. She's qualified mediator, conducting negotiations to resolve sensitive medical and legal relationships. So with this, I want to welcome all of you. I want to remain uh, all the participants that they can ask their questions in the, um, uh, in the chat. And I even will suggest that all participants this evening write the country where they come from, because we are happy to have uh, participants all around the world. And we, uh, we will be happy to uh, answer all the questions in the discussion section at the end of this webinar. So with this, I'm giving the word to Professor Piso. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bariella. I'm just uh, trying to, you see it? Yes, not full screen. Yeah, now. Okay. So thank you very much. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, this evening with uh, this special um, issue because the second victim is something that not many of uh, the surgeons are aware of. Uh, but we are dealing with uh, mostly every day. And um, I remember when I was um, starting a few years ago, my career, I had a very, um, very sad case. It was a quite young lady with a sarcoma uh, and she received the extended rack abdominal uh, operation. And uh, finally she died due to some, some complications. But of course she had a very extended disease and I, I remember that I had to talk to her mother and I had to talk to her daughter uh, after she died and everything happened on on my birthday. So it was very traumatizing and uh, I keep remembering um, this case in, in my memory and um, some other as well. So uh, one day I've asked myself, I, I am the only one having this kind of problems because normally you don't discuss with other friends uh, about it. And finally, I started to, to do some, some research and then I discovered that uh, I was not the first one. And uh, I think René Lerich, the famous surgeon, was also not the first one, but he said, um, every surgeon carries with himself a small cemetery where from time to time he goes to pray 
a place of bitterness and regret where he must look for an explanation for his failures. So I really, really feel bad um, after such um, um, cases. And um, if you look at the more recent uh, data, like for instance, this paper from Dr. Bonan from Annals of Surgery 2019, he was describing it as we all hide our grief, suffer in silence, and the pain can, can be close to debilitating. So obviously this um, happens and it, uh, it, it does happen every day. And I'm sure in your hospital, if you're joining a mobility and mortality conference, which you almost do every week, uh, then you've seen somebody like Dr. S in this case, uh, describing his case, the tone of, of his voice uh, was differently subdued. And um, the words are always slow, humble and introspective. And everybody's listening to silence, so you can really feel the pain as um, this group from the Mass General has uh, done with, with Dr. S among them. And um, they really ask him if he's okay, what you are probably doing in your mobility and mortality conference as well. And um, this takes, Dr. S said, takes some, some months to fully move on. This was his usual processing time, his time for reconciliation, what the colleagues described. This was not the first major intraoperative adverse event or patient death, and he knew it would be probably not be also the, the last one. So it's something that is repeating, something that you are dealing, um, yeah, maybe every week. And basically, if your patient um, was the first victim, then you are the second victim. So this is what we are dealing about today. And it doesn't have to be a medical error. It may be any kind of unanticipated adverse uh, patient event, um, something that at the end makes feel you responsibly and personally responsible for this uh, patient outcome. So um, we have another, another point. It's not only the second victim, it's potentially the third victim. You've done an operation last week, you had a complication. And then you have to do this operation tomorrow. And you're not sure if the case that you are going to treat will not have any disadvantages um, by you being a second victim. So just imagine you, um, you are going in the, in the waiting room and you say to, let's say, Mrs. Jones, sorry for, for you to have, to have wait. The patient before you just died on the table. Not to worry, we are just about doing um, our cleaning up and we'll uh, taking back uh, you back in five minutes. So this has some, um, for certain, some, some consequences. Um, do our patient have the right to decide uh, whether they wish or not to be treated by, by us after we had a catastrophe? And do we have an obligation to inform the patient? And um, do we have to deliver the best we can under these circumstances? Um, this is something we could discuss at the, at the end of this webinar. So the problem is um, that being a second victim, it has two impacts. The one impact is the, the personal impact. Um, and the second one is uh, the professional impact. So what about the personal impact? Because you feel yourself um, guilty for something, um, you are having a very in, um, emotional, intensive time. Uh, you're if having distress, you have self out, uh, you have fear. Um, and these sentiments are really common and may persist long time after the incident. Um, but more, moreover, you can have also some physical symptoms. Uh, you know, you sleep bad and uh, you have obviously difficulties uh, to, to get concentrated. So um, if this takes on and on uh, for, for months or years, um, it may develop a, a mental health issue in your case. So you might need drugs uh, treating an anxiety, a depression, you feel like a post-traumatic stress disorder, which um, also interferes with your, your professional activities because um, you have not much confidence. You are getting defensive. Um, for instance, you avoid to perform an operation that causes a complication just um, a few days ago. And um, of course, if, you, if you're not dealing with it, if you don't solve this problem, it will obviously increase the risk of burnout and uh, it may convince you uh, or others to leave this profession. So um, this may be a huge problem. 
now we have discussed about doctors, but ba basically everyone, any employee that was involved in that patient uh, may, may uh, be a second victim. Uh, of course, doctors and uh, nursing staff are most exposed, that's clear, but it could be somebody else, you know, the pharmacist that's prepared, uh, wrongly prepared um, a drug or, or somebody else that had some contact with this patient, a technician that was not uh, able to, to fix the machine that they need a pump that they needed during the operation or, or similar. So the big question is, uh, obviously that's, um, it's quite common, how, how many people are affected at the end? And um, the, um, the number is probably huge. So at least half of the healthcare employees uh, have at least once experienced um, being a second victim. And if you know that there are so many operations worldwide, and you know that uh, about 1 million people will die during performed operation, well, not during or correctly after the operation due to complications, and you see that there are 7 million complications every year, then you realize um, that the number uh, has to be much uh, more than we would expect it. Now, surgeons are, of course, um, very much exposed because they have an operation, they have a very intense time and uh, there's a big trauma for the patient. And looking at this data and from uh, 2015 from the British Journal, just remember this number, 80% of all surgeons said that they had experienced at least once the um, um, emotional well-being problem and have been second victims. And uh, I just saw a more recent uh, study on, on surgeons uh, just published last year. We don't have to look at that figures, but uh, just remember that um, of those who had um, describing having a part of a medical error, that almost 90% said that they had a subsequent emotional sequela, most commonly as a guilt, anxiety, or insomnia. And only uh, one quarter had received at all an emotional support. Now, these were residents for many for plastic surgery, but not only. And the way they, they described a catastrophe was very different. For some of them, catastrophe was dead. For some of them, catastrophe was uh, the lesion of one nerve. Um, but obviously, it was common, and it is common, and it is particularly common among surgeons, uh, residents. And it has a long-lasting emotional sequelae, in particular for female residents, at least in this study. Now, why is it that we are... Um, uh, so so cruel. It's it had something to to deal with a history of medicine. Uh, Michael Madeus, uh, you obviously was a retired um, surgeon with personally uh, um, an addiction to narcotics. He said this man, and he referred to Professor Halstead, created a culture where you lived in the hospital. So part of the ethos is that you don't complain, you just do your work and shut up, and you have a discipline to be strong and you pretend you're okay even if it's not. And surgery, it has been always very cruel to its practitioners. You know, we always had high rates of burnout, of uh, ergonomic injuries, miscarriages, and in infertility. So uh, this is a problem. And this problem starts very early. Uh, residents um, work a lot, used to work a lot. That has improved now in Europe and also in, in some other states. But um, you still have a lot of hierarchy in, in surgical departments. And uh, this changed you. you. You are learning that see one, do one, teach one is shortened for the system. And this is how surgeons develop their technical skill set and also how they confirm to the cultural norm of the profession. So you basically don't speak about it because um, otherwise uh, you may not appear strong enough. And this is a very interesting um, uh, article in The Guardian just published in September. Um, and um, in this analysis, in this article, they, um, they describe that no one in surgery is really uh, talking in public about a probable mental distress they might have in their, long, uh, in their profession. And have, the surgeons, therefore, have a long experience with a culture of silence. As mentioned before, they have a reputation as being stoic and uh, very determined and, and driven. And sometimes they even forgot their body's natural cues. Um, telling them to rest, to eat, or to urinate. Now, this sounds dramatically, but um, it happened a lot over the last year and, and it's still happening now. So this is why, and this, um, uh, this article was dealing with this, the, the suicide rate among um, surgeons 
is uh, very high among physicians generally, but particularly among surgeons. So if you look here, um, the data from 2003 to 2017, um, almost 700 physicians uh, committed suicide in the United States. And um, among those, 71 were surgeons. And of course, there are many more which go unreported. So who's going to talk about this? Who are going to, who is going to relieve all this problem? And um, this is um, the president of the Association of Academic Surgery, Carrie Cunningham, and she did it. She decided to speak out. It was not that easy, it just happened this year, um, but it has a huge impact because she spoke to hundreds or thousands of, of people. And, um, you know, 2,000 of her peers were listening during the annual meeting of the Associations of Academic Surgery, very prestigious um, association from university uh, from United States and Canada. And she was at that time president of this organization. And um, she uh, said, I was a top junior uh, tennis player in the United States, which is true. She was number 36 ATP uh, among, among females. And um, she says, uh, I'm now associate professor at surgery at Harvard. She works as a surgeon in Massachusetts General Hospital, but she is also human, he was, she was saying. I'm a person with a lifelong depression, anxiety, and um, now um, um, she's taking substances. And subsequently to the treatment, she feels a better doctor now because she feels much more connected with her patient. So she realized there is something we have to uh, deal with and this is not uh, only good for myself, it's good also from, from my patients. Now we are, we are not inventing uh, something new. Uh, pilots uh, have always some similitudes with, um, with surgeons. Uh, in Germany, at least, we had like 20 years ago, the first seminars with uh, pilots from Lufthansa. And if you look um, at um, this program, for instance, Curve or Antiskid, pilots are helping pilots. Um, they realize that um, if, if somebody is uh, taking alcohol, has a reduced uh, self-awareness, uh, is having a loss of social component with family divorces, financial problems, all this may, may cause uh, problems for their passengers. So um, this is why they need some help. And this is not the only program. They have several programs. And we tried to invite them for this webinar. Um, it didn't work out this time, but they uh, are ready to, to support us to create a similar program within Germany or maybe within the European Society of Surgical Oncology. So yes, there are some models we can use. What are we doing right now? Um, what we try to do is to forget. Um, um, there is an Irish surgeon that said there is a ghost in every bed. Uh, but unfortunately, surgeons get long life and short memories. So this is a, a mechanism that um, probably is crucial for you to make you continue to operate when you had some adverse uh, events. I remember my, my first teacher in, in Hanover told me, um, if you had yesterday a complication, you should do tomorrow the same operation that will cure you. Now we know that that is false. Um, probably I would need uh, some time to think about it, like the pilots from Lufthansa, um, to get some um, to get some help, some uh, psychological help or other type of treatment um, or support, and then go on. And another mechanism we are using, um, a part of forgetting the complication, um, is um, to return to the fundamental aspects of a chosen pro 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 uh, uh, vocation and try to get again to rediscover the joy inherent to the practice of surgery. Um, if you treat patients, the patients are very grateful to you um, and you get a lot of positive emotion, a lot of energy back. And this helps you to go on. This is a very, very strong motivation that you cannot buy, that um, you cannot inherit. You just can experience if you uh, treated patients with, uh, with success. So you know, I think it's, um, it's very important for us and this will keep us going. And um, also to finish uh, my, my talk uh, with, uh, with another talk from, from an ESO webinar with Rene Adam, a very famous surgeon. He, he said, yes, be modest. We, if we have failures, we should learn from them. And um, that will help us also to continue and get better. 
but also he's saying, be proud of your job. You save lives and surgeon is one of the most respected profession. And um, it's a bit idealistic, but this is helping us a lot. And uh, I hope during this seminar, during this webinar, we will get some more other reflections and instruments to help us to, to deal with this status of second victim that obviously is um, confronting at least half of us um, during our profession. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pison. It was really interesting uh, presentation and make me thought uh, a lot about um, um, about all this. Maybe everybody now listening have uh, similar cases um, and they wonder what what should happen next. Um, so I just want to remind that you can ask questions in your in the um, chat, and we can continue to the next uh, pre uh, presenter, which is Dr. Margarita Tarain. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, uh, everybody. And thank you for the possibility to join this uh, uh, interesting webinar and provoking because uh, it's posing a very important subject to discuss. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, being human when considered God and the world of the professional idea. Uh, becoming a doctor, this is what I want to start with, uh, and the choice of the medical profession. The choice of the medical profession itself uh, is usually highly emotional charged. It is considered by psychoanalysts as a result of the childhood fantasy of saving emotionally and suffering uh, physically ill or emotionally suffering loved ones, repairing damage, gaining strength, and mastering one's own fears of injury and death. Sorry. Sorry, there is a... Becoming a doctor, uh, it's not only acquiring college uh, knowledge and skills, it's an emotion which values the expectation, um, expectations and integrated and are permanently inscribed. I'm sorry, I guess I have some problem with uh, changing flash sites. But actually, values that have brought, dot, uh, brought the physician into the profession are also those that are seriously preconditioned for further disappointments and even breakdowns. I will say a little bit about the burnout syndrome. Uh, in a naive way, burnout syndrome is seen as simply as a consequence of overwork and overexertion. In fact, burnout is defined as a state of fatigue and frustration resulting from giving oneself a cause, a way of life, or a relationship that has not produced the expected benefits. So in other words, we could say that only those have been burning they can have a burnout. Unrealistic expectations of yourself are considered a key factor. These expectations, self-imposed due to the doctor's own and society's perception, combined with the highly responsible, stressful, and painful nature of the work associated with human suffering, can have a really destructive effect on him. To this, we could add having the treat of fatal error on the back of your mind, mind on an everyday basis. The transfers of the patient, the doctor as an omnipotent savior. The term transfers is taken from psychoanalysis. And it means uh, this specific position, the patient and family assigned to the doctor in their minds as the one disposing of life and death and able to remove all danger and pain. In the attempt to protect himself from helplessness, the patient attributes to the doctor's absolute infallibility, omnipotence, and perfection, an image created to carry all his hopes. In the situation of the serious treat of the disease, patients and relatives especially need these illusions, which gives them confidence and reduces their anxiety. This is especially applicable for surgery, why other specialties need time 
The surgical intervention bureau borders the magic. The surgeon saves from the evil at once. However, it takes away from the doctor the permission, his own and that of the patient, to have any human limit. Uncertainty, powerlessness, and ignorance are forbidden. Error, error is unthinkable. And there is the involuntary identification with the simple from the part of the doctor. Such phenomena lie beneath unreasonable remorse, especially when the physician is confronted with some, some sign of viability. Object to this contra, con, constant pressure, how to distinguish himself from the function that he embodies, how to be tempted, tempted not to believe in it. The crushing ideal of the medical profession waits on the doctor and legitimizes the attacks of patients. It feeds his guilt, self-criticism, and corrosive doubts. And no one has to find about it, which is more important. The doctor, as if by presumption, presumption can't suffer. His role does not prepossess it. The violence of illness, of death, of the gaze of the other, presses himself to be silent, to express what is happening, to suppress what is happening within him, and to move on to the next patient, to the next swap results to the next working day. Human feelings are far from the spotlight of the medical area. But healing requires the recognition of pain and loss, not just the loss of that, but the loss sometimes of the one's own professional idea and illusions of omnipotence. What about the physician face to face with himself? The emotional distress that accompanies medical errors can distort physician's judgment about what happened, as well as whether and how to disclose the event to the patient. The trap of guilt, out of proportion self-blame that ignores circumstances and what and conditions. Actually, the role of system breakdowns is the most medical, most medical errors. This may lead to self-destructive acting out, resulting in truly harf harmful consequences. What are the psychological consequences of the second victim, as Professor Pizzo already mentioned? This is a fear of hum humiliating embarrassment, litigation, and disciplinary consequences, loss of trust, and damage of the professional reputation. Experience of intrusive self-accusations about the harm done, deep remorse, guilt, and shame. Constant rumination over the event, only if I had, and post-traumatic flashbacks. Avoidance, fear of future occurrences, and feeling afraid to attempt difficult procedures. Feelings of inadequacy regarding part patient care abilities. Negatively affected performance at work. Exhaustion, sleep, appetite, and cognitive disturbances, and other physical symptoms. Drug abuse, very often leaving the profession as well, and sometimes even suicide. And what about disclosure? Research data show that disclosure has a considerable impact on reducing legitation and improving patient safety. Patients who sue often cite both the perception that the truth has been hidden from them, as well as deficient communication as important reasons for their, for their feeling a loss rate. Full disclosure promotes peer settlements, shows other research. Disclosure, we can see that enhance the patient's trust in the physician. The most commonly reported reason for pursuing law action is the desire for an explanation, as we see from the patients. So these data suggest that everyone needs an excuse. Everyone seeks an explanation and reconciliation that will allow him to go out of the destructiveness of the real facts and the human error. And what about the barriers to, barriers to disclosure process? This is the poor planning and communication among team members about what should be said, anticipation of patient, patients' likely questions, 
breakdowns in the disclosure process often occur because of lack of such planning. Lack of communication skills and training. Many physicians struggle struggles with what words to say to patients and how to handle the conversation following for hormone er errors. Worry also that an expression of regret might be construed as admission of legal liability. And not at last place, these are the mixed institutions, institutional messages about disclosure. Uh, now I want to present some key component, uh, components of successful disclosure. Two key components of successful disclosure conversation we have. This is first, is the information sharing, and second, this is emotion handling. The initial conversation should be held within the first 24 hours after the event. So the patient should be, first of all, informed that an adverse event has taken place, provided with a truthful and compassionate ex explanation of what the event was, any implications for the patient's health, explained why it occurred and what steps have been taken to mitigate the event and prevent recurrences, given the opportunity, opportunity to ask questions, and also assigned a follow-up conversation. This conversation must include an honest and respectful expression of apology. Patients actually are more interested in whether the apology seems sincere to them rather than what specific words are used. An authentic apology and genuine remorse invite forgiveness. And here are some, some advices for effective communication in disclosure. First, be ready to bear the discomfort of a difficult conversation. It can be easy and it should not be. Accept your limits. Be aware of your own beliefs and attitudes about the adverse event. Face and tolerate, tolerate the attacks, emotions, silence, and crying. Don't be defensive. The real handling is to stay where you want to escape. Mirror and name the feelings of the patient. This takes the anxiety away and sorts out the chaos of emotions. Step back. Give space to the patient. Listen to the patient, not to yourself. Try to understand before wanting to be understood. Be cautious with ambiguity and awkward attempts to getting out. Never use formal reassurances and em empty phrases. Say, I know, I understand, only if you do, re do really know. Hold on to authenticity. Don't be afraid to be wrong. The patient senses the good intention and this is what he needs most. And a little bit about ethics instead of instead of moral. Sorry, there's some problem with the computer. The assertion that an error should be reported as a matter of principle does not negate the need for reflection before any decision to report the error. In some cases, we can legitimately question the justification for talking about it openly with the patient. This closer to anxious patients, litigious families and children as well as disclosure, the disclosure of minor errors should be ethically and practically considered. Making a decision in the specific case whether disclosures is beneficial or not is also a way to respect the personality and vulnerability of the patient. And let's see some ways of recovery. This is to try to move from illusion of unfiability to the awareness of reliability to get away from the fantasized aspects of your function, to acknowledge and tolerate your own vulnerability, to make an active renouncement of the all power of powerful I, of the I could have, I should have, and so on, to take a distance and reconsider, perhaps with a little more humility, your role, 
to make a mental pause for coming back to yourself, rooting back into your personality and vocation so that you can remain alive, not just acting. To all, the restoration of personal and professional dignity to take place. Colleagues, managers, other patients, family and friends can function as a corrective mirror for the self-image. To voice it, to talk it, to share it, and not deprive yourself of support. To take an outside view, to accept forgiveness from yourself and from the other. To give up on the idea of the immediate solution, to give time to time to let yourself go with the process, to dare to learn and to grow, to make a decision to go on finally. And in conclusion, I want to say that resilience is different from strength and it always seems to have something of humility about it. Some questions remain unanswered, some hopes fail. In order to work with suffering, we need to be able to detach and sometimes step back. The Greek myth of wounded healer presents the idea of the man whose pain gives him the power to heal. This is the introspection needed for the doctor to do really well what he was chosen and what he's called to do. And pain has also the vulnerable quality of bringing us back to truth and to why. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Margarita, very much. <clears throat> so, uh, as according to the plan, uh, we will continue and we have discussion at the end. Just I want to say that this presentation is, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be um, placed in YouTube in the next few weeks, I hope. So, next we have Dr. Maximilian Babuke, please. Um... Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Maximilian Babuka, and I'm working in my seventh year as a general and visceral surgeon uh, for Professor Piso at the Barmherzige Brüder Hospital in Ringsburg. Uh, we are no university, but we are indeed a very good hospital for surgery. Um, I started re reading and working on the second victim phenomenon last year before the ESSO conference uh, in Bordeaux and did a workshop for, um, it's called Visceral Medizin in Hamburg in September this year. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, and when researching for the topic, I found four habits for the surgical culture described in the journal of the thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. And I think they are quite accurate. What we surgeons think about ourselves most of the time uh, first, we are disciplined and stay on course whenever necessary. We are strong and pretend we are okay, even when we are not. Uh, we are self-sufficient and can solve especially personal problems on our own. And last but not least, we fix everything, even when we are struggling. And these habits are incredibly valuable and critical skills for surgeons. But like all good things, they are good until they are not. Um, when continued my research, there was a study set up by Scott et al. published 2009, where they held interviews with 31 healthcare providers. They had a team um, of four interviewers, which were trained the same, held one hour long face-to-face -face interviews um, of a 25-item uh, semi-structured uh, interview guide. Um, they Then they independently reviewed the answers and described the path to recovery of the second victim phenomenon in six stages. Uh, the first stage is called chaos and accident response. It occurs right after an adverse event took place. At this stage, the patient needs more attention in the form of monitoring or intensive care or other steps during surgery. And this phase, often more healthcare personnel is called in or others take over the case. The second victim is frequently distracted and immersed in self-reflection while also trying to manage the crisis. The second stage is called intrusive reflections and described as a period of haunted uh, reenactments and feelings of internal inadequacy. 
the victim re-evaluates re this situation with what if questions. Maybe uh, if I have done it this way, it wouldn't have happened or been avoided. After that stage, um, Scott called the third stage, uh, restoring personal integrity. Um, one of the biggest challenges is getting through personal reflections, such as what will others think of me and will I ever be trusted again? Moreover, Scott mentioned that victims in this stage had the inability to move forward, especially with negative departmental grapevine gossip, and that leads to further self-doubt. Um, I think it's all. I think that's already a very interesting issue because, as an institution, it could be positively influenced when creating a good teamwork culture where healthcare providers don't gossip about each other uh, but respect each other. The fourth stage is called enduring the inquisition. After initial focus on stabilizing the patient and personal reflections. There is an awakening that the institution, uh, in most cases the hospital, will react to the occurred event uh, in unclear ways. The uh, affected second victim starts to wonder about repercussions affecting job security or future litigation. Uh, the fifth stage uh, is called obtaining emotional first aid. Um, the affected healthcare provider starts seeking support from colleagues or supervisors or friends and family, but he or she finds it difficult because uh, no one can really understand the personal and professional impact the event had on them. Many second victims don't know who is a safe person to talk to, especially in America, again, where uh, the fear of litigation is uh, intensified. Um, the last stage and most important stage, uh, that's how I found this, uh, this study, is called um, moving on, dropping out, surviving or thriving. There's a push internally from the second victim uh, and externally from co-workers, colleagues or supervisors to move on and put the event behind them. The stage is special because it has three potential outcomes. The first um, path is dropping out where the victim is changing the professional role, leave the profession or maybe move to a different location. They are second guessing their abilities and drop out. The uh, other path, the second path is surviving. The victim is performing as expected at work. They seem doing okay, but in reality they are still plagued by the event and didn't really forgive themselves. Some said uh, in the study that it was impossible to let the event ever go. Um, the last and third path is called thriving. The victim uh, retains memories but grew stronger out of the event. They may change how they practice or became involved in a practice change. They figured out a way for some good to come out of this bad uh, experience or adverse event. And this last path should be the ultimate goal um, when the second victim phenomenon occurs and there are things we could improve in. Um, that's why I wanted to conclude uh, peer support programs in my uh, presentation. Um, those peer support programs are uh, pretty new. They are established uh, since 2006 and mainly in the USA, where more money is involved in the medical system. Um, there's a very good podcast online called uh, Behind the Knife. And in June this year, Dr. Kafarani from the Massachusetts General Hospital was invited to talk about the second victim phenomenon. In this podcast, they talked about a study from 2019, where they described um, how to set up a surgery-specific peer support program for second victims and what participants thought about it. In the study, they mentioned a five-step process on how to create such a program. And I think some things can be adopted for everyday life. First, it is important uh, that there is a sense of urgency for change. This can be achieved with lectures or webinars like we are doing today. Um, Kafarani did it with uh, studies and surveys like the Boston Interoperative Adverse Event Surgeons Attitude Study or BISA study, it's called. Um, 
Furthermore, peer support programs need support from institutions and participants, especially if surgeons are the target. Um, they must be protected from litigation when talking about failures or mishaps. The second step is to choose the peer supporters. In Kafarani's work, they told every surgeon uh, working in the hospital to name two to three persons where they uh, go to, uh, no, no, the um, two to three persons they go to um, or talk to when things go wrong. After that, it became clear um, which are the trusted or well-respected uh, ones in the department. Uh, these peer supporters were contacted respecting a balanced representation uh, regarding gender and speciality. The third step, um, those peer supporters needed training. Um, they were put into four-hour intensive sessions with experts in the field, studied literature on physician health, and learned about resources available to second victims. They trained um, talking to peers in interactive role-playing exercises and adopted strategy, uh, a strat strategy engaging uh, peers. The peer supporters learned uh, to emphasize confidentiality of the conversation, are there to listen and help and not to investigate. They were taught uh, to listen in a non-judgmental fashion and shouldn't uh, trivial, trivialize an event or emotion. Um, when appropriate, they learned to share their own experiences from an adverse event. And together with the peer, they created a plan of coping strategies to and tried to figure out if continued su uh, support was needed for the peer. If the peer supporter has any concerns about the coping strategies of the peer, they should refer them to the next level of support, um, which is uh, maybe a psychologist or psychiatrist, for example. Um, Kafarani included a list of do's and don'ts um, for peer support outreach, uh, and I marked some things which can easily be taken home with. I feel most important is to not fix the situation or bagatellize the event and try to really listen to your colleagues. In the fourth step, Kafarani explained how they figured out how to find potential adverse events. They concluded cases from the morbidity and mortality conferences and patients' death. But most importantly, they found adverse events with the word of mouth because people in the hospital do talk a lot and later um, that became their most reliable resource for uh, finding uh, affected peers. The last step um, was designing a systematic intervention plan. After finding potential adverse events, um, a confidential email was sent to uh, potential affected peers with the offer to speak to a peer supporter, and it contained a list of uh, other helpful resources. The outreaches were designed as an opt-out instead of an opt-in strategy, and the potential second victim had to actively refuse the offer in the email. When they didn't, an informal meeting, for example, a cup of coffee or a short phone call was set up. The peer um, was matched with the peer supporter from a different department to prevent hierarchical problems, for example, a visceral surgeon um, as the second victim was matched with a new surgeon. Um, during the first year of this program, they had 47 outreach with 19% uh, just uh, opting out. And in a survey, after one year, they uh, asked the participants and 81% said that the program had a positive influence on the department's culture of safety and support by raising awareness. For Kafarani, the level of support is three-tiered. The first level is informal and local, uh, just at the place where the, uh, yeah, the adverse event is happening between surgeons and their colleagues. And the uh, last or uh, third level is the professional institutional support with psychologists, etc. Et and the second level is bridging the gap um, between both with those peer support programs, for example. 
Another classification is the breakdown into informal and formal support. Informal support for a potential second vi victim uh, could consist of helping the victim leaving the location or situation. Um, when they do that, they uh, mostly heal faster and better. Uh, colleagues could offer support by talking openly with the victim and ask for a description of what happened but they should accept the description without minimizing the importance of the mistake and without investigating. They can ask how the victim is going to cope and maybe help with other techniques. For the victim, it can be helpful to pursue routines like sports, hobbies, uh, or everyday life. Um, and the formal support could be a peer support program, a stress management program, or structured debriefings after adverse events uh, and the last thing we are already doing in our hospital but as we all know until today they are rare and not well accepted by surgeons those uh, formal support programs um, i would like to end my presentation with some final words from daryl campbell the chief medical officer from the Uni university of michigan um, he said in the classical training program we have taught how to perform surgery but we have not taught how to live as surgeons. Perhaps it's time we change that. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Baruke. It was really interesting. Um, and um, uh, well, a small comment I want to make while listening to your all three presentations. And uh, I was thinking at the end, um, we we have learned maybe that the patient um, is not the only suffering. Uh, also, the family of the patient is suffering, uh, his their friends. But it's the same. It looks like it's the same for surgeons, right? Because um, while being a second victim, um, this is also affecting our families and our friends and our external from the hospital life. So. Uh, the impact of all this is much bigger than than we have used to think by not talking about this at all. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking again, it's a, a matter of um, boundaries. Again, we have problems with boundaries uh, as a surgeons, and I think also patients have problems with this uh, by sometimes expecting us to be more than we can uh, give. And um, and uh, here I want to ask a question um, because Margarita she talked a lot about the disclosure. What we should um, that this is actually um, the thing defining the relationship with patients uh, before surgery. And I had uh, this uh, conversation also with uh, Kalina in the last uh, two days. Um, and this is perhaps something that we don't pay enough attention, uh, the informed consent of the patient that is actually the things that we are describing there are real. And maybe if we pay attention at the, uh, them in the beginning, they can actually, this can make us feel better <laughs> if, if some of these things happen. Because at the end, the patients are uh, the ones who are responsible also for their own body and the decisions are also taken by them and also the risks. So Kalina, maybe you can um, tell us some more about the, inf the informed consent, how uh, from the legal aspect of this. Yes, of course, um, according to the Bulgarian law, here is obligation for every doctor and hospital to uh, bring in uh, patient's hands an informal consent which should um, have information about the disease, about the diagnosis, about the method of treatment, about the risks of this method of treatment, and of course about the risks if the patients uh, do not want to treat by this way. So if you take all of this information for you and bring it to the patient, um, the, all of the um, decisions patient should take would be in and with all of his mind. So uh, your responsibility will be uh, split between 
the doctor and the patient. According to Bulgarian law, patients have not only rights, they have uh, obligations, but in many cases they forget this. And they think that the only responsible person in this um, relationship between doctor and patients in, are doctors, all of them, and nurses and other medical staff. Because of this, there are a lot of um, complaints and a lot of cases about medical malpractice here in Bulgaria. And um, statistically, uh, the number of cases are um, more and more, and um, they increase uh, because it's typical uh, here in our made, uh, televisions, and it, it's more uh, common than other type of uh, media, um, to make a lot of noise about probably an, an eventual medical malpractice. This gives um, this way of thinking and this um, journalism, I, I can't um, relate this with um, real journalistic, but um, this way of thinking may um, some really bad um, view of doctors. They are as a devil and uh, in a way they feel guilt and uh, if we relate with uh, some patients lost uh, already professor people said that uh, surgeon feel this guilt and feel um, emotionally uh, damaged and after that this case could be media um, show off with, with all of that uh, uh, circumstances of the disease or for or with bad habits for the patient but it doesn't matter because the the victim of this uh, material of Bulgarian television or other media are only doctors and uh, it's really bad because here we are forget that the obligation and um, all of responsibilities are split between doctors and patients and these documents, I know that all of doctors um, do not like documents because it's kind of um, really boring uh, part of their job. But this document, this informative uh, consent, it's really good and kind of protection for your for yourself because if you have um, a lot of information about all the risks their take this patient take with this um, procedure surgical procedure or um, medical treatment with the kind of medications and drugs other drugs um, there should be um, responsible for their own decision and this is the, the crucial role of this document in all of your practice uh, here, I would like to, to add that uh, yes, I, um, I, I will just, um, I just want to, uh, to tell you that uh, a statistic in Bulgarian cases, but it's um, from 2016, uh, said that one third of all uh, cases are because of bad communication between doctors and uh, patients because of bad in informative uh, consent, because bad communication and um, totally uh, ruined relationship between doctor and patient. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the communication be between doctor and patients is really the basis of many conflicts and uh, things that uh, may go wrong. Uh, but in my experience with uh, patients who are going to undergone uh, surgery, usually there are two types. One of them, they are very anxious and they, they what can happen and all that. And the other one, these are, uh, for them, it's just a form of signing of something without thinking. And one of the research that I met uh, uh, now is that usually patients doesn't uh, expect 
to be victim of a medical error. They don't suppose that the medical error may, may, may occur, even though they know it. Uh, this is something interesting for me from psychological point, point of view. Maybe it's because again uh, about this uh, image of the doctor that uh, he's he, he was going to to make everything perfect, uh, uh, and also uh, for the for these uh, journalistic uh, uh, attacks after that, uh, which are really very painful for everyone. Uh, usually, the reason for this is that when something gets wrong, uh, when when we feel some pain about it. It, we need to get rid of it. There, there should be somebody who is uh, who is uh, uh, who is wrong, who has done something wrong. And uh, this is usually this is the problem to to be so so severe these attacks. We, we just need to get rid of what we feel. Unfortunately, in this situation, all of the society forget about doctors' rights. Doctors' right to make malpractice because this is a high risk profession because of this this, prof this profession here in bulgaria i have an obligation to has um professional um uh, insurance i forgot yes <laughs> insurance sorry i just lost the, the word uh and because of high of risk, of risk it's it's highly risk profession and um, because of all of these bad um, journalist uh, materials, all of doctors um, taking maybe um, they are kind of devils in our society, and there's um, a kind of slang that the doctors are the mafia in a white coat, and it's awful. Let's hope that uh, this is not global problem. <laughs> and now maybe we can give the I word hope. to Professor Pizzo. He's going to say something. <laughs> yeah, I, I was um, I was wondering how can we move from from here because we we heard some data from uh, from the Mass General Hospital. Obviously, they uh, do really talk about it and have some very good programs. So um, I would ask. Um, Maximilian Babuke about his opinion how to to build up a peer support program in in Germany to, to start in Germany and then maybe extend it within the European Society of Surgical Oncology. So we, we have two options: either we um, get the help of the pilot peer support program, although we don't have details yet, and then ask the colleagues from the Massachusetts General Hospital to help us, or the other way around. But what would you recommend? to me as a president of the, the German Society of General and Visceral Surgery to start with next week? Um, there are some programs in uh, the Netherlands, I think, uh, the Scandinavian uh, countries um, already um, starting. And the problem is that peer support programs are not new um, for healthcare personnel. But for surgeons, uh, it's important that they just talk to surgeons because uh, surgeons don't connect with uh, other stuff in the hospital or physicians. And uh, they had like support programs before, but um, it was uh, not well visited uh, and accepted by uh, people doing or performing surgery because the the um, results from a mistake are um, much worse and direct. So if you cut the wrong vessel and maybe the patient is going to intensive care and dies because of liver failure, uh, then it has like a, a direct consequence. And yeah, um, I, I, I think it's difficult. We, we need a surgery specific thing I'm not sure if we can work with pilot, pilots hand in hand, but they are more experienced uh, in setting up those programs. Um, the problem in uh, Europe is that we do have uh, a lot of work and not enough money to, to fund those things. And you need um, 
when I showed the data, how they figured out um, which people to contact, uh, which can be a peer because they are trusted in uh, in uh, the neurosurgery or visceral surgery, and uh, people responded. Hey, I going I, I'm going to talk to Dr. Müller. Um, Dr. Müller is always listening and helping me. Um, then you uh, need to go further and uh, get Dr. Müller to uh, take part in such a training for uh, hours. And then he has extra work because um, maybe he has to do a peer outreach. So it's um, I think it's difficult to convince the old surgeons to uh, participate, but maybe uh, time will change because the... Um, mind of surgery is changing right now, I think. Uh, we, we have a question also in a, in a chat from somebody from, from uh, I guess, Portugal. Uh, Luisa, yeah, I, I've read that already. And the second thing um, where, the, where she's asking about uh, overwork and ignoring the emotional burden, I think that's not uh, the second victim phenomenon because you need like an adverse traumatizing event and overwork is like chronic. Uh, and I don't think it uh, it's the thing we are talking about, but the um, an adverse event can lead to burnout in an other way. And I think overwork is not helping while healing she's from brazil so sorry for <laughs> but it's the same well, similar language nice that you're joining us luisa okay um kalina has a question maybe yes uh, i was really interested in um, presentation of two of the doctors here uh and uh, i have a question because here in Bulgaria there's no typical governmental support for doctors or um, kind of rules uh, and um, procedures what to do where there is medical malpractice. Is there in your countries and your um, health facilities you're working kind of um, operative procedures you should do when there is medical malpractice you're already known is done. Who did you address the question to? Um, to the two of us, for you, Professor, and uh, for uh, Dr. Maximilian. Okay, Dr. Maximilian. We don't hear you. I, I didn't understand it fully, sorry. Is there operative procedure in your health facility you're working in, uh, what to do where there is medical malpractice from some doctor, from surgeon, for example? Is there a kind of rules you should um, take and uh, the procedure you should take uh, after medical malpractice were done? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, can ask, I can answer that, but he knows it as well because... Uh, obviously, we, we have that now and then in, in our hospital. It's a department where we perform more than 3,000 operations every year. And um, if you have something that may become a malpractice, we have a standard operating procedure. We involve different departments of our, um, of our uh, hospital, um, including the organizational structure, also the a lawyer. And then um, there is a clear description of, of uh, what to take care of, including the documentation, uh, the communication with the patients, the um, information regarding the, our insurance companies and so on. So because every, every step that is not wise in this situation may uh, cause you a lot of regress um, from the patient and um, um, will cost at the end a lot of money, uh, the hospital as well. Because uh, Dr. Babuka showed a slide with uh, you should go to the patient and tell him, uh, show empathy and telling him, I'm sorry. That, that's almost at the border to recognize that you had a failure, which you should not do due to medical reason, uh, le legal reasons in front of the patient. So it's, um, 
it's it's a bit of sort of a difficult situation but it, just to uh, answer your question yeah there is a standing operating procedure and i think there will be in many many other hospitals as well uh, i think we have something in the chat again yeah um uh, I, maybe i can answer that um we don't have a peer support program at uh, in Regensburg, i think and i'm i'm even not sure if we have it uh, uh, nationwide um, but I think it's important to um, maybe uh, convince the people that it can even save money uh, if uh, an affected person or surgeon is dropping out of the institution and he is well respected and um, uh, he's, he's changing his job then there's like uh, a lack of um, earning money with surgery and, uh, and there are even studies uh, how much that can cost the institution so that's one point I think uh, the other thing is that setting up a peer support program is cost intensive and takes time but I don't think um, when people are involved uh, it's not that stressful to maintain so I did show the outreach and they were like a phone call, an email or a cup of coffee. Um, and uh, in most cases, that was already enough and people felt better after that. And uh, I think it's it's not it's not that time consuming, but the training for the peers is. So you, you need a, a really big facility with a lot of surgeons to build such a system. Or if you have more hospitals in a region, maybe maybe you can make it region wide. In Austria, they have um, a phone number, I think, uh, where you can call, uh, but just doing work hours. <laughs> uh, that's even a problem in itself because we are surgeons, we work longer than most people. Um, yeah, but in Germany, there is not. I think we, we discussed before that actually there is no, in, in Germany, in Bulgaria, in many countries, maybe there is no um, governmental program for this. It's actually, um, as in the case of Margarita, for example, she's uh, establishing a unit uh, of this herself. So it's not really uh, well organized on a national level. Um, Margarita, maybe you can tell us how you started, because it's very fresh, that you, what you're doing. We can't hear you. Actually, this was an idea that I'm, I was thinking about uh, 10 years ago, and I was trying, uh, but now, uh, finally, uh, we, uh, we decided it was it started from the, some ethical questions that arose in the the hospital and at this moment uh, we i decided to present this uh, phenomenon the second victim and to propose this to to make this group that can react in the in uh, situations like that and uh, unfortunately this was accepted by the management of the hospital and now uh, I'm going to work in this direction There is also an inter interesting comment in the chat, and this is something that uh, um, I also asked Professor Pidum you know, in the chat, uh, if we should use the word sorry, because this, uh, actually Margarita had it in her presentation that we should, um, it's okay that we are sorry. Uh, but, um, so the comment in the chat is from UK. Um, they, uh, she, the lady said, in UK we have duty of Candor reporting to patient system in which an early inclusion of the word sorry is encouraged and expected. It's ex explained to us that this doesn't equate to admission of guilt or, li or liability and, and it's welcomed by patient and relatives. Um, so I don't know, um, maybe Professor Piso can comment on this. Uh, why, why in Germany maybe, or I don't know. Um, it's not so recommended to say sorry early. Uh, probably is, um, is is a cultural point. I, I was told once that uh, that is sort of a, a admission of, of guilt. So um, 
it's um, it's more recommendable to say uh, it is regrettable that that happened. So in that way, uh, you admit that something negative happened, and uh, that is generally um, something that um, should not happen and uh, should be avoided. Um, it's sad and so on. But it's um, I think it's you know it's um, maybe Kalina can explain if 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 there is a difference. What's the difference between sorry and it is regrettable? In fact, here in Bulgaria, the communications is really bad between doctor and patient. Um, the some words couldn't um, make the, the the difference in some court case. This is this is the truth. This word "sorry" or uh, it was um, unexpected, or it was my mistake. Um, no, no matter. It doesn't matter what you will actually set. Uh, the only problem that using this word, it's in your head and with communication with the patient. In court, it doesn't matter what you actually said to the patient. Because mm -hmm. in the, in court here, uh, our, our legal system, we are using documents. It, it doesn't matter what he said, what she said. We are using documents, and if according to documents, you do not have any error, so you do not have any error, uh, despite you said sorry. But I, I was also wanted to comment, so um, to actually, so this is the second victim, right? To actually have guilt of something and to live with it. So um, maybe by confess, by saying sorry, confessing, and taking you're you're taking the responsibility that the patient is also taking his part, um, and um, yeah, I think this is part of the process. Uh, uh, it's, if it's regrettable, it's not done by you, um, but if you are sorry, then it's done by you, and you are the second victim because you have this guilt, and maybe you are right to feel this guilt. Maybe you did something, maybe not uh, legally wrong, but something that caused uh, that hurt a third person. Yeah. So well, yes, I, it, it's 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 strategy strategy of of, um, of of speech, but but not legally wrong. Just, just to be to be clear, we, we should show empathy and we should show our regret because we are all human beings. So no doubt about it. You just uh, if if you if you're going to express too much your regret, it is still better to talk to somebody in your hospital about this from the juridical department uh, to get sure that you are not doing uh, any wrong uh, step um, or uh, moving in the wrong direction. But otherwise. Of course, you should show your empathy, and of course, you should. Be, you're a human being; you should care, not only of your patient, but of also of your, also his family. And I, I think uh, Mariela, somebody wanted to talk to us through his camera, but we still have only two minutes. I think this will not work now, but I promise we are going to to build up a program, and if we succeed, we are going to present it here next year. So um, we're going to speak live to other participants as well. But we still have two minutes, Mariela. Yes, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how much we can say for two minutes and maybe just uh, um, like a continuation of what you say that uh, first we should speak with someone uh, from the administration or um, I would say also something like Dr. Bab, okay, maybe you should speak with a mentor. Mentorship is lacking globally um, and for young surgeons it's very important. Um, this mentorship it relates not only to surgical practices but also for a, a personal life development uh, and work-life balance and protecting burnout and all this stuff. So perhaps um, we should encourage um, people to search for um, mentors and other people to become mentors. We say here, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. So <laughs> maybe um, maybe we should be more active in this and this can be the first step of everyone's personal program for burn, protecting burnout and um, in, in his career pathway. 
So yes, uh, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, we are uh, in German time, very strict. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. It was really interesting. I think um, we talked much more than actually we thought about this before. So thank you very much. And I really hope we can make this um, a traditional webinars. And I hope to see you uh, next time. And just a short reminder that ESU has a DCIS webinar on 7th of December, so don't miss it. Um, it will be very interesting as well.